welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us here this evening at the Community College of Baltimore County. Um, we are here doing an artist panel for the summer juried show entitled Unveiling Resistance, um, which is a show that is focusing on utilizing art as a tool of protest. Um, yeah, I, and so we are out of like too much to, to, uh, to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll go do introductions, but I'm trying to think of like the show. Um, but, um, but yeah, so my name is Thomas James. Um, I was the juror and curator of the show, and today I'm joined by three artists that are in the show, possibly a fourth. Um, so first, it's Helen Zahed. Um, <laughs> Pronounce the name right. Oh, you yeah, know. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, I don't know. Do you want to? Do you want to? My the questions are kind of going to have you all talk about your work. So yeah, that's the bottom white side. And Kim Rice. Um, if you guys that are here, if you grab the, um, the little paper printout, it has each of their pieces that are in the, in the show. So you can use that have a reference point. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, if that's, if you guys are kind of cool with those in terms of the kind of the piece of the, piece of some, some, uh, some questions. Do they need to know who we are? Yeah, well, that well, so that that was going to be my first question. Okay. If you all could speak a little bit about yourselves and the basic practice, but on the sheet it explains okay. like who you are and stuff. So, okay. But I'm not okay. Now they're getting the sheets. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so for those who didn't read it, yeah, maybe you guys can just introduce okay. yourself quickly and okay. um, talk a little bit about the practice. Should I just start? Yeah. Can you guys hear? Okay. Have the microphone. So you should put it like a little bit. Don't yeah. crack it. Don't crack it. Is that better? It was great. Oh, okay. Um, and Thomas James, thank you so much. So honored and pleasure to be working with you again. And my um, esteemed artist colleagues in the show, um, so excited to see the actual work because I have not yet seen them. Um, I am uh, an Arab American born in Lebanon. A lot of my work is focused um, over the past decade now on the Arab Spring and its aftermath, its, its beginning, and then very quickly evolving, um, especially into the Syrian war. And so some of my pieces here, uh, and much of my practice over the past 10 years has been talking about migration, immigration, forced leaving, um, disappear, um, what happens to people who are forced to leave their homes. And um, um, this exhibition, I think, speaks to a lot of that, and I think that's why I am um, part of this show. But that is, um, I'm, I'm mostly a painter, we have, but I've been doing some installations as well, um, because sometimes when I'm thinking about this topic that I've been working on now over 10 years, it's so large that it feels like it has to go off the canvas. And so it's turned into some installations, which I don't, I'm a little insecure about, to be honest with you, but um, thank you for showing them. And um, I feel encouraged by that. Um, and they've been shown other places as well, but um, it's a little bit of a departure for me um, from my painting over the past 10 years has turned into some of that. So you have a combination of that. Uh, but that is where my heart is right now as an artist. Um, I'm trying to give voice to people who don't have a voice. Um, crossing borders here, crossing borders there. Of course, we have Ukraine now as well. Uh, just change the country, change the people, and you have the same situation. OK, so I'll stop talking because it could be forever. Okay. So that's the bottom white side. Um, a lot of my work deals with um, you know social issues. Um, early on in my career, I did a lot of uh, like abstract work, and then um, a 
around the time that Michael Brown was killed, you know, my work kind of, you know, changed direction and I started, um, you know, dealing with things that affected people that look like me. Um, and, you know, I really aim for my work to, you know, kind of be my voice and to, you know, just, uh, just to show that I'm not okay with the way things are. So, you know, all my pieces deal with issues that most, you know, black and brown people face and, then, and, and also just issues that I feel like don't get addressed enough. Um, so I was happy to be part of this show uh, because, you know, it just went right in line with, you know, all the work that I feel like I've been doing for the past five or six years. So, um, yeah. Hi, my name is Kim Rice, and I'm a Baltimore-based artist. Uh, my work deals with the white construct, white supremacy, institutionalized racism, and I've been working on this for about a decade now, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Hi, I just sent my videos. I'm sorry, I was teaching and then I'm coming to so I apologize. Um, my name is Fahimi Badat. I have been working in the field of uh, human rights, women's rights, and children's rights for over 25 years. And uh, my work continuously dealt with, the, with these issues, uh, specifically with um, violence against women worldwide, but also specifically in the US, and comparing it to what is happening to the country where I was born and raised when I was 18 when I left after the revolution of 1979 in Iraq. So um, it has been uh, so important to do this research, comparative research uh, within the um, domestic violence, especially, and uh, women's and human rights abuses. Um, in Iran and in the U.S. actually, and uh, and it's uh, to be surprised that there are a lot of um, parallel actually going on with what's what's happening when I did the research with the um, ethnicity, for example, and race issues. Of course, in in Iran compared to the U.S., we don't have race issues, but there are other ethnicity, ethnic uh, cleansing, religious um, cleansing, and so forth, and of course women's rights and children's rights, which is parallel and then prison a system in the U.S. when you compare U.S. prison system with what's happening in Iran. And of course I do look around the world, in South America, for example, I have visited Argentina and I have, uh, you know, went through all those uh, atrocities took place, the, the places that the atrocities have taken place. So, so they're, they're, I look at everywhere in terms of being able to do a, compare, a good research materials to bring into my work. So um, we can talk about that. Thank yes, you. thank you. Um, and thank you all. I know sometimes talk about yourself and kind of these things, but I appreciate it. Um, so this show deals a lot with cultural imperialism, it's something that I think is a through line with all of the work um, from the artists that are, that are here. And so I wanted to, and if everyone has the sheet, this will work out perfectly. Um, in order to give the audience a little more context about each of your work in the shop, I if you could speak directly about the specific pieces or piece or pieces that you have um, in the show. Are you Do you want to start? Oh, Anyone can start. Turn. Darn it, I shouldn't have sat here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Um, and thank you also to audience who's here as well. Um, so the specific pieces uh, that Thomas um, selected for this show, um, I have, yeah, I hope you've gotten to see the show. I hope you've gotten to see the show. Thank you. No, those oh. audience. Um, okay. So uh, I have protest signs in there. Uh, my father is from Damascus, Syria. And um, 
you know, we had to leave, uh, evacuate you know, from the civil war in Lebanon in uh, 1975, so a few years after the revolution in Iran, where I remember very well. Um, so um, at the time, we left my father there, and my mother and my two younger sisters and I were uh, forced to leave and uh, to Greece, uh, to Athens. And at the time, we were like the last plane before the airport closed. And uh, my father um, said that we would be gone for one week. And that week was 35 years uh, that I finally went home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we talk about home too in this show as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I went back, um, to Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. Um, and then I came back to America. I did an exhibition there. I went to see my, where my family, my father was born in the old city in Damascus, Jordan and Beirut, then came back to America. And about a few months later, the quote unquote Arab Spring began. And, um, and so in documenting that as an artist, because that's all I know how to do, I gave a talk yesterday, and they're like asking me, "What would I?" I said, "Well, I'm not the ruler of the whole world, which I would change in half a second. But since we're artists and visual artists, we have to speak from our own voice." Um, so, I began working on work uh, for the Arab Spring, and from the initial hopes of optimism, which we had for equality for women. Um, the price of bread, and you guys all know how the Arab Spring began with the um, Tunisian man um, setting himself on fire um, uh, because he was a vegetable. He, he had a vegetable cart, and he wanted to get a little truck, you know, and he was down in the main area, and the woman security officer actually I confiscated, he didn't have permission, so she wanted a bribe. And she confiscated, because he didn't have the money, she confiscated his livelihood, which was a vegetable cart. And he tried to protest his case, talking about protests, he tried to protest his case at the government building to no avail. So he set himself on fire, right? And that was the beginning of the revolutions, what they call the Arab Spring. And it spread from country to country to country. In Syria, it ended as a, a few kids at age of around 12 and playing football, um, soccer football, sprayed graffiti on their walls of their school, anti-government. There, there were little kids, they were 12 years old. Uh, they were arrested, they were tortured. Um, this is in a city called Dara, which is uh, in Damascus, a little small city. And because it was their village, basically, um, the families and the relatives of those children protested the treatment of their children. They were like 12. And that turned into the revolution in Syria that's how it manifested and then turned into the larger issues of what the Arab Spring was. But it was that little fire ignited by that. Um, so one day I was, um, my father is very against protesting. <laughs> and I was always protesting. And I, my mom and I tried to keep it against him. And then there was a big protest that he was away. And somehow, like he has powers. <laughs> Somehow we knew. And so my mom and I swore to keep it silent. And we were eating dinner, and the news came on, and he said, did you protest? I'm like, yes, Daddy, I did. And OK. Did you accomplish anything? No. You have a sore throat? Because I shouted. Mm -hmm. I said, yes. You feel better? I said, yeah. He's like, okay, that's it. Those protest signs we picked up that are in, in the exhibition, 
as well as part of my migration, um, Syrian migration pieces that uh, inspired by Jacob Lawrence's amazing migration, um, where I was seeing the parallels um, from the war um, in Syria, which is ongoing. It's till today, but people forget. So it's still today. Um, and so I began seeing the parallels between Jacob Lawrence's migration uh, from African Americans from the South to the North that he painted in 1940 and 41. Um, so I have now about 46 of those pieces. And you have several in your show. As well as um, what you have are some small children's clothing um, called Dust in the Wind, um, which is a song, old song. And you weren't born. And no, no, no you weren't born. And, um, but anyways, I kept thinking about also our borders. I do talk about Syria because that's where I feel my, where I can speak to, but it's universal. I am, I'm talking about everything. And I'm talking about also our borders here um, and the same issues that are um, happening to people trying to, you know, have what we all want, which is freedom and safety and peace and shelter. And, Clean water. Yeah, I could go on, but I know it's perfect. So the piece uh, that I have in the show is called um, "Always Bread for War." And um, at the time when I when I thought about making this piece, I was working for a political magazine in D.C. And you know, I, I knew that you know the U.S. spends you know tons and tons of money uh, for war, but I, I never knew how much, and you know, I remember hearing like I think it was like seven hundred, you know, billion dollars. That was the defense budget, um, and you know, my mind was blown because I mean, yeah, I knew it was a lot, but I never, I didn't know it was that much. And you know, like you just you constantly hear, you know, there's not enough money for, you know, to improve the the metro. There's not enough money for affordable housing. There's not enough money to have clean drinking water. You know, but there's never a question when it comes to war. And, you know, even with, you know, um, Ukraine and Russia, it, you know, I remember just watching the news and they were talking about, you know, defense contractors predicting, you know, like, you know, just lots of gains coming in from this. And I'm, and I'm just like, you know, the war hadn't even started yet. And they were already talking about, you know, how much money and, and, and the weapons they were going to be sending. And there's just, you know, never a question you know, when, when it comes to war, there, there's never anything on the news that says like, well, where are we, we going to get this money from? You know, it just, we immediately go into it and that that's an afterthought. Um, but when there's anything that's actually going to help people, there's always a pause and there's always like, well, how are we going to pay for it? Um, so, you know, when I made this piece, you know, I have a person just cutting up bread, um, like on a, like on a cutting board and then, you know, the pieces of bread are falling off and turning into bombs. Um, yeah, and, you know, like the, the, the whole idea is just to call out America on its hypocrisy and just to say that, you know, there is money for all these things. It's just about America's priorities and war is always a priority and the people are, are never, you know, never one. So um, that's just what I wanted to show with this piece. Um, the work that I have up is called Founding Fathers, and it is a image of, like, an iconic image of the Founding Fathers uh, who, who wrote the Constitution, and then running through, woven through it, is the 1705 Virginia Slave Codes. And the way that it's woven together is it creates masks on them, which is ironic now because of COVID, but I, I created this work before we were masking up. And so the idea was to kind of like have have the look of a bandit or what would be called today a thug. And so kind of flipping the script on the mythology around the, the Building Fathers, the mythology around the Constitution itself, um, and, and understanding that these men um, were slavers um, and plunderers. And uh, this is really the essence of what um, 
our country was founded on. And uh, this, the 1705 Virginia slave codes were, were really interesting because they're the first time that they really started to um, separate European Englishmen into white um, indentured servants and really started to um, separate the servants and, and, and claim um, those people that were African American to be slaves. Um, and they, they put in it tons and tons and tons of laws um, that I could talk about for days. But that was, um, that's kind of the, this idea that the aristocrat, aristocrats, aristocrats, aristocrats yeah. um, feared an uprising, right? And so they wanted to make sure that there was division within the people that were under them. And this bill solidified that. Um, and yeah. It's it's really amazing how how much power and money goes into used to be involved actually. So um, anyway, my piece in the exhibition, first of all, thanks to Thomas for coming with this great idea of putting this amazing work together and for the artists, of course, to participate and thanks to the audience to be here and hearing us talking about our work. Um, the title of, of my, my specific piece in the show is, is called um, Stop Execution of Children in Iran. It's a, a little earlier work and it deals with uh, continuous executions of people after the revolution of 1979. Um, and again, it deals with um, mostly um, minorities of any kinds. If you are uh, you are a uh, Sufi Muslim, if you are Baha'i, I am. Which, uh, if you are a Kurd, if you are a Baluchi, if you are any type that you are not from the mainstream, which is Shia and Muslim. And even if you are Muslim, if you are rich, and if you are, if you are not working with the government and working with bribery system and this and that, then you are not uh, part of the the elite in the government and subject to torture, execution, or rape and disappearance, which is a yeah. which is another huge huge part. This. Um, I want to shed light on what is happening with the death penalty and executions in uh, several countries, that U.S. is one of them, actually. Uh, there are a handful of countries that are actively um, participating in, in the death penalty and executions, and each country has their own method of execution. In my exhibition, you see the role, you see the actual role uh, that, um, that is there. And of course, they have switched since then. They have switched to more of plastic rope that they use with cranes and publicly hang people. My cousin, 32 year old nurse, who was a volunteer nurse in Sh the southern Shiraz, um, she was part of the uh, 10 young women who were hung publicly uh, in, in Shiraz. And, and um, their bodies were dumped in, a, in one uh, in a little pile and, and buried that way. And um, the thing is that Reagan, President Reagan, was begging the government. That was the June 18, 1982. You can tell if you want to go there. And um, the date, I should say. And um, President Reagan begged the government of Iran not to execute this and women. They were students, they were the youngest one, 17 year old. And, um, and this piece is also dedicated to her. Her name was Mona Nahmadinejad. Uh, and uh, her father was also executed, but separately. Um, so so it's, it's just there's a lot of uh, story. Um, Continues to that, but whatever President uh, Reagan did, there was no avail, and they, they were actually 
executed on its on the time it was set up for them. And their crown was being Baha'i. Mm -hmm. And um, and but the, the whole issue is that the Iran is next to China, is the uh, largest uh, it, ha it holds the largest number of executions every month and every year. And uh, and if you compare the the um, population versus the size of the government, of course, of course, Iran become number one executing uh, people, and uh, especially the children who are not 18 years old. It's the last education on the planet of children. So that really is, is uh, very important to this issue to talk about. Um, but the what, one thing that Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and other human rights um, um, organizations has brought to attention is that they just are, we knew about these, these uh, secret executions of 30,000 young people have been executed in one summer of 1989. And Raisi, who is the president, the, the uh, current president of Iran, he was the, the person who would sign the name of people. My, uh, they, now Amnesty International, they have the names, they have the um, the um, you know pictures of these uh, people, uh, all young, majority young people, men and women. There is no uh, discrimination when it comes to institution women versus men. So that uh, let's keep that clear. But um, but it's it's really this is thirty thousand. I want to to work on that. Uh, my my work is going to lead into into dealing with this, uh, with this uh, um, horrific uh, executions that chain, like a chain, has taken place. And people in the world, all around the world, didn't know about it. But uh, except, of course, the people who were, their families were suffering. My cousin, around my age, uh, and my uncle, they were both in prison. And because this is one time that being Baha'i saved their lives because they were looking for political prison, pre political prisoners, not religious prisoners. And they let them go after 10 years. They were in prison in hard, harsh condition. He would be getting um, taken in many times to, uh, to have the noose around his neck, but then would, as out of torture and take them down, um, you know, to they would do that to to prisoners, I guess, political and conscious prisoners of uh, in Iran. But uh, he and my uncle both were were set free because the answers they were looking for they didn't get it when they were questioning them and, and uh, torturing them to find out if they belong to different. As, you know, political, uh, you know, sect that they were against. So, so that's that's unfortunate. But U.S. also has um, is on on this list that I, uh, I as I said, I do compare comparative research. And um, right now, for the next two years, Oklahoma City, for example, has. Um, has a schedule to execute every month one person. So um, there is no way with uh, all the you know protests or uh, you know requests and this and that is not happening. So. Yeah, and you know, so I think even even having the word unveiling um, in the in the show title sort of speaks to. Um, why curatorially I chose a lot of the work I chose, especially you, know, you all's work here, um, is because you know whether it's whether it's human rights violations, slave code, the defense budget, the Arab Spring, um, you know all of 
all of the, the work that's being the work that's being showed shown is hopefully uh, introducing people to these things that are going on. Like unveiling uh, it. Kind yeah, of essentially, yeah. yeah. Like taking the veil off mm -hmm. what's being hidden or not shown. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that is um, that's an important that's an important distinction to make because a lot of the a lot of the work that I that I choose to to show in, in the exhibitions that I curate, um, I like working with with artists that that within their practice there is um, some sort of worldly. Will be research or, or um, an exploration outside of themselves um, and their experiences, and so that, that that kind of that leads me that leads me to another question, um, which which is about the not only the purpose of creation but also the audience in mind when you all are creating. Um, and the way I'm going to frame this is that. You know, so having having this sort of show, I think that it's important to have this sort of show here um, at a higher uh, higher uh, education um, institution because it allows for the the students as well as professors, etc., and then just the general public who come here looking for seeking some knowledge to be able to come and see that um, that art and art making has the ability to to teach you. Um, so I kind of want to ask and. It's okay. I get it over with, and I get to uh, listen to the brilliant answers. <laughs> um, but so my my question is going to be, is um, when you all are creating this work that has these um, a lot of it is this very recognizable iconography or um, like provocative uh, messages or materials. Can you can you talk a little bit about the the audience that? Um, Either you have in mind the audience that normally views your work, um, and or maybe uh, interesting responses that you may have received from audience members that you may not have. Yeah, I mean, I love that question. Um, I will, I will just, I'll bring this up again. But yesterday, I was speaking to the School of um, Ethical and Global Leadership. I never even heard of that before, but. Um, these students were around the age of 16 and 17, and I was presenting my work to them. They had gone to the Phillips Collection to see mm -hmm. Jacob Lawrence's work, Vibration, and then come to see uh, what I was presenting. And, you know, they could ask questions. So they were from all over, and this one young boy came up to me. He, was, he said he was from Boston. He said, he, he said, I've never heard of any of this. And you opened my eyes. I, I just showed my images and told stories, like what we're, we're doing, we're telling stories. But I thought, okay, that is really interesting. And I said, so you're never gonna unsee what you saw today or unhear what you heard today um, through what I explained um, of my work. So he said, absolutely. And so, I mean, I think that ultimately, what I hope for from the viewer is I would love to have a dialogue, but what I ultimately would hope for is empathy. You know, what you're just talking about with your uncle and what I've seen in Syria, and we have a big problem who disappeared in Syria. So, and they want to send everyone. I just came back from Turkey, as you know, from Istanbul. I was working with Syrian refugee students there um, with my art. And uh, we were painting on shoes, little shoes that I brought. And um, those young people, they're, they've already had a help, right? And they got to Turkey, smuggled or otherwise. Um, I was working with one fellow uh, named Hani, and he, he and his brother, their family paid everything for them to be smuggled to Turkey mm -hmm. from Syria. Um, where their city was, was is Homs which were under siege for six years, and there was no hope for them. So the, the family gave all the money to the two sons, of course, the sons, <laughs> you know. Um, one brother was uh, smuggled across off the wall, from the wall, to go over, like here, and I don't know how it is there, but there's a wall between um, mm -hmm. Syria and Turkey. And um, Hani, my friend, 
uh, the one I was with, he was smuggled underneath the carriage of the truck. How he, and he, oh, and then I, I could see his expression, how he was, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm so sorry, you know, we're talking. And he said, I, I, can't, I can't hardly acknowledge it. Like, um, so, I mean, and then they come to Turkey, and what I kept hearing over and over and over again, facing racism, they call it racism, against them, um, a, a Syrian, um, so that they're afraid to speak Arabic. They try and pretend only they can speak Turkish because they're bullied so much in school and on the street they're assaulted. And so this is, so, you know, I, I guess what I want, I want to keep this in the open, like you said. I want to, I want to be in a place like this where people don't know and then they can learn. And, um, and for me, a lot of that is the voices, what you were also talking about. To keep, to keep the voice of people voices and to disappear. And um, that extends to men, women, and children as well. Um, so for me, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Um, I think so. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Okay. You. <laughs> so basically, you're just saying including it in mind when making the work mostly about. Yeah, so I mean, like, if I'm if I'm making work that deals with, like, police brutality, you know, I always imagine, you know, if a police will see the work, you know, and, you know, I think about the people that are going to see the work and have a positive reaction, but then I want equally or even more people that are going to have a negative reaction to see the work because, you know, they're the reason I'm doing the work in the first place because they've created, you know, these systems. So, um, you know, where I'm from, right outside of Asheville, North Carolina. A lot of, um, a lot of racism, a lot of like, you know, uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of people that look like me. And, you know, those people know me from growing up and they don't know me through my art because that's something I started doing when I moved to DC. So I always think about them when I make my work because, you know, it's so different than what they know me for that they pay attention to it. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of trolling some of those people a little bit when I do my work because I know they'll see it and I know they'll get upset and it, and I'm, you know, I'm in a different city and nothing anybody can really do about it. Um, so I think about them, um, and then, you know, I also think about myself and people like me who didn't really have a background in art because I think not understanding, uh, certain pieces kind of kept me away from being an artist for a long time and, I guess around eight years ago, I started working at the Shields Collection. And the first room that they put me in was um, the, the Migration Series. And I just remember being like, you know, uh, this this is the most powerful work that I've ever seen. And it's also, out of everything I've seen, like I understand it better than anything else. And, you know, when I decided to become an artist, I was like, I don't think my artistic ability is better than anyone else's, but I feel like, the subject matter is going to be heavier, and it's going to uh, it's going to hit people more powerful than just if I was painting something that looked exactly like something else. So you know, I think about that when when making my work. Um. So I think it's my Angelo quote that says, um, "Tell tell the truth to yourself and to the children." Um, and and my work, I think, is very. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a step back. Um, when when I was little, I was thinking about this on the drive here. When I was little, like a little kid, I all like I knew that I was lucky, right? And I didn't know why I was lucky. And um, and I would sit when I was like six or seven or whatever, I'd sit over at my grandfather's house and um, and he would watch the evening news. And so I'd watch the evening news on the black and white television with him. And um, and it would talk about all the things that were happening globally and like all the atrocities. And like, I just couldn't figure out as a little kid, like 
why was I born into the family I was mm-hmm. born into? Why was I born in the country I was born into? And why am I so lucky? And in our family heritage, the response was always like through a Christian perspective mm-hmm. of like how God, like yeah, you were God, special because of God. Um, I took it that way, mm-hmm. um, and that didn't align with my belief system, right? And then as I grew older, and um, you know, had more experiences and more friends and all different things, it was once again it was like this un- un- unveiling occurred, right? And then as I read more, there is more unveiling. And so when I think about my work, um, I'm really thinking about um, white people specifically. Um, first of all, that's the only way that I ethically know how to um, to create the work. So I create the work as a white person um, for white people um, about whiteness. So I'm telling I'm telling this story because first of all, this is this is my story, and this is the American story um, to a certain extent, and um, or one part of the American story. And, um, and so I'm, I don't know if I clarify, I kind of, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, nervous all the time. You're not, you're but good. yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's that really, like as white people, we haven't, like, we created the construct of race, we benefited from it, we created these policies that conti- that we continually benefit from. Um, and so um, it's that, it, and we, we as a white culture, haven't taken the time to really delve into that, into our own personal histories, into the American policies and the ways that we benefited from it. So my hope is that my work um, creates an avenue that will allow um, white people to start to um, take a look at themselves and their upbringing and um, the policies and procedures that have gotten them to where they are today. Um, and, and I try to make things pretty. Uh, I have a, I have a aesthetic um, that I really am invested in, uh, the craft aesthetic, and um, things to be very beautiful. Uh, and because when you make things beautiful, uh, hopefully somebody will take a, a closer look uh, especially from my experiences uh, talking with white people about whiteness, um, it can be there can be a shutdown really fast. Um, we've made a lot of gains in the past couple of years, obviously, uh, in terms of people saying the word white out loud now. <laughs> white people say the word out loud, white out loud now. Um, but uh, but still, I think that there's there's a a long way to go but of course my work is for everyone and I've had um, a lot of strong strong reactions um, from people that um, you know people from uh, different communities Um, I'm a kid since I have lived relocated it's funny that um, you have also went through Greece to yeah. leave to get to Europe or yeah. US. And um, it was um, like three days before war, before war between Iraq and Iran started when I left the country. And the only country that was allowing at that time the, the, the Iranian to get there was uh, to get to their country was Greece. And then from there, I had to go to Spain and then to England. I was there for two years until I relocated to the U.S. And of course, uh, there are a lot of stories associated with that. But, but for me, America has, it's like, like has two fold. Mm-hmm. Has the, it's, the, it's the place that has buried so many pain and suffering of our groups of people, whether um, American, whether the native Indians, whether the, um, the um, 
African descent we call we, we meet now in what we call blacks in them, and then the Japanese, the Chinese, and the and the others, which the the others are also has grown to be much larger groups. So so that that varies all these all these things and now starts to to kind of open up this wound, this big wound has started to open up with it, especially with uh, with um, uh, Floyd and, and all the um, events that to, uh, came after that. And, uh, but then the other side of the uh, America is that it, it allows people to come in from all sorts of background and, and, um, and they come here and they have the opportunity to work hard and to make something that of themselves that they believe in, even there are the red things, even if there are all these other things that white people have the most advantage of, you know, and given that. Uh, in, in art history, when I was a student, I would always I would ask my professor, why, um, why all the art from all over the world is compared to just European based art? That means that 
that uh, the work is, is effective, but it's each of us being with the study very um, specifically, a lot of my work, people say, how um, how could you deal with such such intense subject matter in your work? While when we look at it, we see all this beauty. Yeah. Like, there's so much beauty in the work that, especially my, my large uh, drawing series that deals with uh, women and children all around the world, violence against women and children, especially young girls. And the work is, is so aesthetically beautiful that people have a hard time when they come closer and see the work, the work unveils itself. It's a beautiful title you have. And, and that's when people question that because the aesthetic, and I always say I'm an artist first, so the aesthetic is, that's why we have training and we have um, work to develop our aesthetic more and more. So, so they do play a big role, the aesthetic, but then also the subject, the content, the voice you want to, to bring out, to share with the audience, if I may say one more thing, um, the audience always re react with, you know, with the work from gut feeling. It, it has a lot of raw emotion in my work that, that, that affects people, people who have you know, if the work is up and they can interact with the work. So, and a lot of my work are installation set up, so there is interactive aspect to it. I invite the audience, I like the audience to join and do something with the work. I think and the aesthetic like creates the opening for the yeah, conversation. Exactly. Of course, um, yes. And I personally found like when I started this work uh, a decade ago, it was because I was reading all these books and my art was something completely different and I I didn't know how to handle all this information. Like I didn't know what to do with all these policies that I was reading about. Um, and so it, it went into the work, but I think that that's like that that tricky thing, that not, that, not like we're tricksters or anything, but like trying to figure out the best so way. A little slightly yeah, The so best way to connect yeah. with your yeah. Um, with your audience and like you, you're like in your face and that yeah. totally works. Um, but, but the aesthetic is still there too, the, the pull on it, the, the hand. Yeah, I was another where, where um, can I, can I ask another oh. question or do you want? Um, well, I just kind of want to follow up on that, um, which is, which is specifically about the art making and how you all find your own balance in how far to push the work, politically, somewhat politically speaking, like how you know how how much how much material, how much um, iconography, how many you know, how, how much wording, etc. How do you all find that balance, and you know, and still being able to make these works that are um, aesthetically beautiful? Yes. Yeah, how, do, how do you all find that balance? Well, I mean, I'm I'm agreeing with. You guys, I, I, I can say an anecdote, but I love that question. Um, I was on a panel a couple years ago um, with two German photographers. Did, did I ever tell you this story? Um, and so, <laughs> and so, maybe, maybe, I just don't want to repeat. And, um, and one photographer, um, they both uh, were from Berlin and um, German, and they were working on refugee centers, what they call them in uh, Germany, of Syrian uh, refugees. Wow. Did I, yeah, 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 but it's, yeah, but it's how the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and so yeah, we were just on the panel, and this is the first time I'm meeting their work and meeting them. And one of the photographers, uh, he has very large, both of them, very large portraits of Syrian kids, refugees, just like um, normal kids anywhere. I don't have kids, but just like kids um, playing jokes or being kids. Um, but they happen to be Syrian refugees. And the other photographer, uh, you know, he had kids that were made from the war, from, you know, it, uh, eye off, arm off, leg off, huge. And I'm looking, I can look at one, and I, ha I turned away. But I'm, I mean, he's already, I already am there, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then we're at the panel, 
and then he said to the audience, he said to the audience, um, uh, if anyone here in the audience knows where I can exhibit my works, because nobody wants them. The one guy who was like, and I thought, I thought to myself, well, this is very interesting. He has his message. He has his story he want to convey. But how is he successful if nobody's going to look at it? How, how is he reaching? Or he might as well just be in his studio in his dark room and nobody, you know, I mean, it, it was something that made me think. Um, and so I, I think it is important to have some sort of an aesthetic quality. I like that. I, I lost the word yesterday. Something that's going to bring you and then you can listen. You know, like that when I was a word. We want to want to catch you and then you listen. And um, I think that's important. I also think human beings respond to beauty, whatever that is. I agree. I haven't seen your work up there yet. I'm very anxious to. But the hard hitting, if it's hard hitting, but if there's an aesthetic quality that's going to bring me, not even knowing you, not knowing your story, not knowing what you're saying to me, am I going to be drawn to your work or am I going to be turned away from your work? So I'm not even going to hear what you have to say. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how that's actually the greatest. I mean, how, especially doing you know, your work, which is, you know, very overt. Um, how are you finding that now? If you want, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, so the the so my question is, is how do you in your art making practice? How do you find the balance uh, between creating something that is aesthetically pleasing while also utilizing these um, these tools of overt political messaging? Um, I don't know. I think working, you know, working for a political magazine for a long time, yeah. like kind of. You know, helped out with that just because you know I was constantly making illustrations to try to get you know featured on the website, um, you know, paired up with an article or whatever. I mean, it's happened a few times, but it you know it was like the, the colors and everything were were fine, but it was way too in your face for you know this broad audience. Um, so I mean, I don't know. I think like the colors is, is kind of what I use to kind of draw people in. Um, but besides that, I don't really, you know, I don't really care. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like through my whole life, like I've just kind of been, you know, it's like it's, my, my opinions have been kind of like too extreme for the, the, the environment of where I was in. And now finally being an artist, you know, I feel like I can finally just like do what I want to do. And so when I try to pull back, you know, like, um, you know, some of the, the work from being, you know, so in people's faces, you know, I feel like I don't, I don't make good art. So, and I kind of feel like this is like the only lane, you know, for me. And if, you know, I'm not making work that's, you know, in, in your face like that, then, you know, I, I kind of just feel like I'm, I don't, my work doesn't stand out at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, choosing the colors it is kind of, what I use to, to kind of make the work aesthetically pleasing to myself, but I don't really, I don't think about a larger audience that much, you know, when I'm, when I'm you know, working on the composition of the work. So. I think that you bring up the thing about honesty, like being honest with yourself and with the work. And um, I guess that's the way I would uh, talk about my relationship to my practice. Um, just constantly trying, just trying to be really honest with myself and being like really honest about the work. And, um, I'm, a, I'm a maker, like I'm very tactile. Even when I was doing two dimensional work, it was always moving parts, like physically moving imagery around. Um, I steer clear of the computer just because like this doesn't do enough for me. And a lot of my ideas come out of like actually working with the materials so not sketching in advance like i read in advance and um, i write about ideas in advance but i don't actually do much sketching um, i'm really just moving the objects until something starts to click um, with me i think that for me personally i i like the visual quality of repetition 
and I like the metaphor of like like repetition functioning almost as a meditation. Um, and I also don't think of meditation as um, something that's easy. <laughs> um, and I like the idea of, um, I guess I don't, I don't necessarily like the idea of being in pain, but my, my work is um, because of the type of labor that it is, um, it becomes painful a lot of times to do <laughs> repetitive work over and over again mm -hmm. um like i currently can't feel my fingers <laughs> you know but you know go carpal tunnel um but there's i think that there's something that happens like when you're honest and you put it all into the work and the best I can compare this to is like some of the pieces that were at the um, BMA a couple years ago, the Black Abstract um, mm -hmm. exhibition. Like I sat in that museum multiple times because the work had energy coming off of it. And I felt like the labor of those pieces had something to do with that, like that spirit. Like when you, when you actually leave something, um, in the studio or in the piece. So that's kind of the way I go about my work. And I like that, um, that the work, I use a lot of craft because I, I like the democracy of it, right? Like anybody can weave, anybody can crochet, anybody can do these types of things. Even, um, my background in printmaking, just a democratized way of making a gener intergenerational thing, a um, something that can be passed down as well, um, something that's a lot of times women's work. Mm -hmm. So all these things that I, I like about um, the types of ways that I make work. Thank you. Um, for me, again, we talked about study, how important the study is the, with selection of materials and the medium. I work interchangeably with several different mediums as a printmaker, as a painter, as a, a person who works with a lot of fabric and, um, and uh, textile. Um, so the drawing, of course, is the foundation for everything I do. Uh, all comes to play when I'm in the studio and working. I don't sit and say, okay, I'm gonna just work on this. Uh, in, in uh, paper and, uh, and print, you know, I just work with it. But some sort of idea, again, the research is done, but everything starts in the studio and work with that. But um, the whole concept of um, audience has uh, started to, I, I never make the work for the audience, but, but I do want to um, make the work for for the audience who is going to be affected and who's going to uh, to know about these these atrocities, these um, uh, injustices and violence that is is has happened and gone, and no one hears about the suffering of individuals and so forth. So those are the those, again, raw emotions are there in, in my studio. It's difficult, it's not easy. It's, uh, sometimes I just I just have to leave, and mm -hmm. sometimes I break down, and sometimes, you know, I'm more charged to finish uh, the thing that, that I need to, to work on. So, it's, so it comes to a, to a point that it's done, and it's ready to be, you know, to put it out for the audience, you know. And, um, and it's, it's that balance we talked about that um, keeps everything alive. I, my work has been censored several times in different states. And um, why? The work has been attacked and slashed down, you know, why? Uh, so, so there are, um, and that we are talking about 25 years ago and on, it's not just, and the most recent uh, censorship I, I experienced was uh, 2011. 
So it's, it's like, and, but I don't self-censor myself because that's the worst thing you can do as an artist to, uh, right now, if any person, uh, government agent of government of Iran is here, is planning, would plan to see how they can get rid of me somehow. Even in this country, which is my home country. And, and, um, and it has happened, and it, it, there are several, um, several um, uh, problem people have been, have been, uh, you know, um, try to, to stay, uh, what do you call, take them back to Iran and per, uh, persecute them. Um, and of course, you heard about the um, Ampeo and also John Bolton threat. The Salman Rashid was just, um, you know, was, um, slapped, you know, um, got um, attacked, so forth. So, so there is that risk for me, for sure. My work is, is I haven't been back to Iran for 42 years since I left. Um, so I haven't seen my sisters, my mother passed away without seeing her. And um, there's a lot of pain and suffering in this person, in this heart, but it's so important for me to stand out and resist. To keep going. Mm, yes, and, and to to make the work that that um, that communicate with people. Art is about communication and that's what what um, what energizes me and I hope um, continue to do so, and I hope curators uh, become, become more supportive of this type of art that could reach out larger audiences uh, because the aesthetic and beauty is there, the, 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 the you know, relevancy of the work is there, but um, the museum uh, directors and uh, curators uh, need to open up and not show a specific type of work, you know. That's why black art matters. That's why um, art from different parts of the, the world um, matters to be seen and to be shown and to be discussing. And honestly, I never have been in, uh, associated with any galleries and I never seek, seek out to be part of never have, have that wasn't my priority. My priority is to make art that speaks to audience and send them out, you know. Uh, and that's, uh, that I think um, has, a, has a stronger message when there is no specific, you know, uh, well, there's no, benefit, what do you call it, a beneficial benefit, monetary benefit attached to it. I have worked hard to to maintain my my uh, you know uh, daily living so that I can and I you know give up a lot so I can do that because that's that's almost like my my mission to to continue on that and that's that's why I applaud you Thomas for for giving me um, two exhibitions that are currently going on with such yeah. strong, strong, uh, top, you know, and you have brought, you brought really amazing audience. The work is really strong, um, but from such diverse background, which is really what we need. That's why I see America in that type of situation, that give opportunity could come, you know, if you keep working and staying positive. Uh, do you have any questions from oh, anyone in here have questions or anyone from online? Uh, thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. This is a really engaging conversation. Um, my question is a little bit too prompt just for everyone on the panel. Um, the main idea of it is how do you avoid kind of, um, I guess, how do you navigate um, the potential for your works to kind of create um, an echo chamber 
uh, around yourself. Um, so kind of going off of that, like how you approach the idea of nuance um, and the topics that you're talking about. I know the work that you're making is obviously very, very political and there's a lot of dimensionality to how you can approach it. Um, and obviously all of you are taking a stance in terms of how you do that. But again, like how, how you kind of introduce like that idea of nuance um, while still navigating the idea of that, but while avoiding it becoming echo chamber. You know what, that's a great question. I, I could just say a little bit, we were talking about the migration series and Jacob Lawrence, which I know you're familiar with. No, no. <laughs> Oh, he will be. He you will know. be. Okay, you just look it up. He's, yeah, he's like the hero. I have a husband, but I would have married him if he didn't have a wife. But okay, you know, and my husband knows that. He's like, oh, go. But anyways, but you know what? He did, he, he taught, okay, what he did was create, and 30 of them are at the Phillips Collection Museum in D.C. You've got to go see it. Um, and he created 60 panels, narrative panels, uh, 12 by 18 panels, which you're very familiar with, that um, talked about the migration of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North. And he painted those uh, 60 panels in 1940, 1941. And in those panels, he talked about segregation, of course, Jim Crow laws, lynching. He talked about the most hideous kind of war. I talk about it with the Syrian migration, like paralleling war, like bomb, bomb kind of war, you know, and chemical weapons, which is outlawed, but they still used it, um, killing 1,400 people, mostly women and children. But you know what? He did it, we're talking about aesthetics. He did it preserving dignity and beauty and um, resilience of the people hit who he was talking about. Um, so he was talking about these hard-hitting um, issues, but he talked about it, he, he visually talked about it, and narratively wrote about it in this very succinct, very direct, sort of beautiful way, you know? And um, so I think he was very successful in that. Um, in terms of what I also, and I've been hearing with you guys, I say, and you are letting us, I say, don't forget us. Don't forget, don't forget what's happening in Iraq. Don't forget the history. Don't forget what's happening right now. Don't forget what's going on. I talk about Syria. Don't forget Afghanistan, Iraq, Ukraine, Somalia. Uh, just switch it out. And I think it's the, uh, do not, don't forget us, you know? Mm -hmm. And I echo, thank you because you are not forgetting us and our voices and what we may not bring monetary, but it's, it's we're, you're letting us speak. Um, and so anyways, that's what I, I don't even, I don't think I answered the question. Well, what, one thing that I wanted to, to kind of add and, and I appreciate the, the, the kind of words, um, but I think for when, when it comes to creating an, an echo chamber, um, you know, people that are interested in creating work that you know will, people will agree with, uh, you know, like your audience and things like that. Um, from a curatorial standpoint, part of the way that, that I do that is bringing in a diverse audience, or um, a diverse group of artists, um, as well as showing in, in many different places. So, for example, we have this show here, um, CCBC, which is in Essex, Baltimore County. That's a certain group of people. Um, I have a show right now, closing soon in, um, in Arlington, Virginia. That's a certain group of people. I have a show, well, we just closed. Um, I had a show at um, the 1111 Gallery in DC. That's a specific group of people. And so the way that the way that I see it is that each, each show has the ability to reach a different group of people. And so the way, the question that I ask myself is what do I want any specific group of people to see? And I'll give you a quick example. There was, um, oh, which, I mean, our, you came to the show in Arlington. Um, there was, there was a, a video piece in the show in, um, in Arlington that spoke that the, the, the two artists, there was a video of a performance piece that these two artists um, that are uh, Vietnamese 
that they made he's American, they made this video speaking about the traumas that um, were left behind in Vietnam and the um, and the and the children of folks that were affected by the Vietnam War and essentially who has to carry that trauma here in the States, in, in Vietnam and, and, and beyond. And in that video, they were, they did a performance piece at um, the, the Vietnam War veteran uh, memorial in DC. And my father who came to the show, he said that when he, he sat down there and he watched the video and there was a, a man who was, sitting, who was sitting next to him and as the video was going on, he said, um, he said to him, you know, some of my friends are on that wall, meaning the war vet, and he left. Um, and so I say that to say that that sort of reaction, that's, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, but that, I'm sh hopefully that the, the man who was viewing that left with some sort of, with something to, to think about. Mm -hmm. But that, that sort of, that, that particular person, he might not come to a show like the, this show that we're doing here at CCPC or another show that, that's at another gallery in DC. So, um, bringing it back to, to what you're saying, you know, it's, it's not always it's not always up to up to us as um, as artists, as curators, as um, anyone in the arts field where exactly our work goes because you know you have to be. Most of the time, you have to be asked to carry the show, or be in the show, or, or or do a program, or a residency, et cetera, et cetera. So that means that there have there is all there's there's some built-in interest already. Um, but I think that being in being in this sphere, in order to do the best that you can to not create an echo chamber, is to try and disperse your your vision, your mission, your purpose to as many different places as you can um, in, in all different types of hierarchies and, and whatnot um, as, a, as a way of, of touching as many people. Because the people that have come here to CCBC for you know, a lot of you know, students and professors, the, the folks that came to Arlington, a lot of that is young children and, the, and as well as the, the residents of, um, you know, in, the, in close proximity to to the to the center, or anyone that can take the metro, and then the the eleven eleven gallery for the most part, those are those, those that audience is more of a um, of a collector base audience. So again, so you're touching many different people at the um, and and allowing your your vision and mission and purpose to reach those people. That's my answer. For me, it's like I do a self check, and so when I started this work, I started it at Oklahoma and when Barack Obama was president. And so the idea to be talking about what it means to be white in that location at that time is very different than in Baltimore 2022. And so every time I go to a new series, it's usually because I'm feeling like people aren't talking about this. So now it's time to move. Like when I started doing my redlining work, it was because people hadn't heard about redlining. Um, there's a lot of people that still have not heard about redlining and the way that people who look like me benefit from generational wealth. Um, but, but many people have, so then it, then I, then it switches up again and again. And so now that we're in 2022 and, you know, there's all these books out now on whiteness and people are saying, you know, white privilege and white fragility and all these things, then it's time to check in and be like, all right, is what I'm doing right now, is this just talking about what other people are talking about now? Am I in an echo chamber? Am I just reiterating what these other people are talking about? Or, you know, and and if so, then it's time to move and and then what what is that next conversation going to so that's kind of how I handle that. But yeah, I mean, it's a constant, you know, <laughs> how, how much are we moving, moving out or just with it? I usually allow the work just keep um, working and keep um, 
being part of that voice, that original voice that I started. Uh, so um, they, I go for every time um, I'm about to change, I would uh, go back to domestic violence because that is such a huge, huge problem. It's pandemic all around the world. And, and it's so hurtful to see that the, um, the numbers have, have not, has not changed over decades that I have been dealing back and forth with this topic in, in my work. And it's so unfortunate. And um, the recent body of work, Color of Violence series, deals with, with, with just the, the healing aspect of after you know, the violence has occurred, whether by gun or, or by you know, slashing or uh, different object of violence, which I had a large series dealt with object of violence. And then um, this, this whole healing aspect of a um, of wound, the wound healing, and going through uh, scientifically and medically, the body goes through uh, eight stages of healing and changing colors. And I have done a lot of studies on that and, and um, you know, looking to, from medical point of view, from uh, color studies, and I have worked with with dyes, like vegetable dyes that I brought from India, to work on these large canvases to uh, to make these, I mean, and it's hard to make this, uh, dyes that you want to match the color of uh, that wound that is healing a different type of skin. The color of the skin also changes that whole uh, phenomena of healing. And, and the, the whole irony is that I really have, have focused on American uh, domestic violence and how much of, of the violence occurs by, by uh, shotgun and by guns rather than by other means of violence. Uh, and, and that is this, the, the uh, Numbers are just are just really uh, blows my mind away when we talk about um, you know forty three thousand people were were subject of um, domestic violence and gun violence uh, related to that gun violence in twenty twenty and that's like are you kidding me in the U S and we don't talk about that we don't hear about that and. And still, the whole notion of domestic violence is hidden, and either wearing makeup and cover, or, or for uh, all these reasons, it just gets so. For me, it gets uh, covered up basically, and people don't talk about it because the perpetrator is usually they, they of course part of the family or close to the family. Therefore, you do, that's why it's called domestic. Therefore, you don't. We try to hush, and, and and this continues because we don't speak the name of the perpetrator. We don't bring it up, and therefore it continues. So we have to break the cycle, the cycle of violence. But how? And that's that's what for me, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not an uh, old subject, rather something so urgent and important. Therefore, I keep I don't. I feel like I don't need to check myself as a as an artist, rather check the the numbers and, and see people and and uh, see really look into the the person into their eyes and see uh, if they are actually hurt, hear them and and all of that. Each individual, if they hurt hurt each other, then this this pandemic will change. I mean when physical pandemic came came out two years ago. Look at what happened. The governments took over all the whole world shut down. But when domestic violence is happening every corner of the world 
And of course, in Iran, it's completely different than Afghanistan. In, in uh, Af some African countries, in India, in Pakistan, these are very different than the domestic violation that takes place, or violence against women, I should say, because the government is the perpetrator, and it's the, it's the government who causes a lot of a lot of hardship and and violence against women, which is happening right now in Iran. It's like that's highest again. So 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 yeah, it's it's like I feel like it's, it's like it needs to be done. It needs to be addressed. It needs to talk about and discuss these these topics. I think I have one. <laughs> so, uh, they're asking that, can you describe what you are working on in your studios right now? Um, do these works continue being shown at the exhibition or they're exploring other things? Um, and where do you see your work evolving in the studio in the future? Um, before the second question, I, I, I know I want to be um, cognizant of time yes, and because yeah. we're, we're over and I know that some people still want to see the show. Yes. Um, so I want to ask you if, if you want to, well, we can do that, but also I do know that people may have to leave, so if it's in, you know, you got to live, you can, I just want to kind of gauge, you know. Since I, I, I was talking about what I'm doing in the studio right now, I, I can just uh, uh, talk very shortly about that and then I'm done. <laughs> um, um, as I said, I, I go back to this topic. The topic is more important to me than than um, uh, if I have the materials or not, then I, I prepare and get to work. Um, but um, the, the whole um, notion of continue, continuing in the studio is, is like really a privilege. It's, it's absolutely a privilege. And um, and uh, and I really am so grateful to have this opportunity to be able to do what I do as an artist. Um, therefore, uh, right now um, I'm working on on, on this uh, continuation of co uh, the color of violence series. But um, I'm re I am thinking I have been thinking for for uh, several years before this became public, like internationally public, about the 30,000 people who have been executed in, a, in, a, uh, in Iran in the worst condition, I would like to bring more light on that, uh, on that, in, on those uh, horrific events in Iran. So, so I feel like uh, I will get there when, when the time is, is there. Currently, I work with print and, and drawing with these hand dyed canvases that are painting. So, so I'm going to move into that direction. I did do a series of uh, prints that deals with revolutionary women in Iran and in the US. So, that's something I'm still working on. That's a kind of a fun project for me. In small work, that's like my smallest pieces I have done. Thank you. I've been working in Caution and Danger Tape um, for a while now, maybe six months or so. Um, my space is full of yellow and red, and to be perfectly <laughs> honest, I'm like visually over it because um, it's just it's a little intense. So I've got to finish up some of those uh, pieces that I've been working on, uh, and then I plan to clean out the space. Um, I have a solo exhibition in a year that I want to do a really massive, massive installation for. So. And be taking a new direction for that. Um, currently, I mean, I guess for the last uh, two months, I've been working with uh, doing like a lot of wooden sculptures, um, and then also kind of building these uh, kind of like replica TVs, but they're all out of wood. Um, I'm planning a show later this year where they're all going to be um, like these wooden TV screens, um, but then you know all different subjects. Um, but yeah, so that just been working um, with the wooden, uh, you know, panels, and then and then also getting into some three dimensional uh, wooden sculpture, dealing with the same issues. Yeah, I'm for the same issues. I'm actually collaborating with an architect, which should be cool. Hopefully, at the 
Kennedy Center of the Beach show next year for Refugee Day um, um, on encampments and um, let's go. Uh, yeah, it should be interesting. And a migration series as long as it's you know something new is coming into my mind, um, so I'll keep working on that as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Oh, I'm really glad you're here.